All right, welcome to Responsive Web Design. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to position content with Flexbox and create adaptive layouts with media queries. So um, since we have like a, a pretty wide range of experience in here, let me just like kind of survey real quick. Tell me everything you know about responsive web design already. Start calling some stuff out. The idea is you can go to any screen and it should look good. Yeah. Any screen. What else? <laughs> Finn. Design once. Arlene? Yeah. So changing elements. This is kind of the complement to design at once because it's flexible and it moves around. Sometimes you want different content on uh, like different screens. Um, and so the technical term for that is adaptive. Cool. What else? What else do we know about responsive design already? Yeah. Kind of along with the, the changing content, the functions still should still re remain the same. Yes. Um, anybody remember M sites? Yeah. Yeah. What were M sites? They were like the separate mobile mm -hmm. version of somebody's website. Mm -hmm. Different URL, yeah. like completely different style sheet. Um, they usually sucked. They usually had half the functionality. They took a bunch of stuff out. Um, cool. What else do we know about RWD? Um, it's a pretty good start. Um, what kind of challenges do you think we face implementing this in CSS? Especially those of you who've done projects and tried to make them work on phones. Or projectors. Or projectors, for that matter. That's a good point. We often think about it in terms of phones, but uh, uh, in my 600 students, uh, you think I haven't seen a couple like, all right, everybody, I can't wait to show you my, why does it look like they, just come over, everybody come over here and crowd around me and look at my screen. It looks better on my screen. Why does it look this bad? Um, because we also have to adapt to jumbotrons. It's not just our personal laptops that we're designing for. Neat, what else? Or challenges that you think we face implementing this stuff? Uh, like readability or like accessibility. Mm -hmm. So like someone that can't read on a small screen and you think it looks good small, mm -hmm. they can't read it. Absolutely. Um, what about like technically, like CSS kind of stuff? DOM kind of stuff? What's hard about making someone responsive? Why don't you all know how to do this already? I guess is what I'm asking. Um, so if you're doing DOM manipulation with like a JavaScript mm -hmm. thing, and you're like, you know, reading through everything that was created as as it's happening. So mm -hmm. um, some of the I think it depends on the con context. Yes, absolutely. So as we're dynamically creating stuff, that means we can't expect it to be a specific size. And so we have to put it in containers that grow. Cool. Here's a fun fact about that. Um, by default, HTML is plenty responsive. We make it unresponsive. Stuff wraps when it gets to the edge. If you have too much content, the stuff gets bigger. It does all of that on its own. There's one thing that stops that from happening. Anybody know what it is? It's one particular CSS strategy. It's not P tags. Yeah, Samantha. Is it because we set like heights and widths? Exactly. It's setting like pixel heights and widths. You go, this should be this big. And then as soon as something needs to be bigger than that, that's how you get the, uh, the world famous CSS is awesome sticker. <laughs> <laughs> if we hadn't set a height and width on this, that would, the thing would have just gotten bigger. So that is like, that sounds like really simple, and it is. That is probably the number one thing that you can do to make your site responsive is just to stop using fixed units. We have percentage units, we have 
uh, things like M's that are relative to the typeface. We have all kinds of other ways we can do this where we get some amount of responsiveness just right out of the box. Okay, so I want to walk you through the uh, exercise that we're going to do. So the idea is that this is uh, My Little Ponies. This is the thing that you brought down. All the content's in there already. This is what, let's say, desktop, laptop, something like that should kind of look like that. And then on mobile, it should probably look something kind of like this. And so we need to be able to uh, make it look with the same content uh, like these two different ways. So the n first thing that you should do, uh, so I, let me get the site running. All right, so this is what we have right now. It doesn't look great on desktop. And when I throw it on mobile, also not a whole lot better. Um, there's one thing that we can do that makes a huge difference on this. I don't know if it will with like at any styles on it. But I always forget the syntax for this, so I want you to look it up so you get some muscle memory. Um, responsive meta tag. This first one at the top and the uh, second one. We're just going to throw that in the head. Doing that alone uh, resolves a lot of like mobile fuckery. So when I hop over to the index and just throw that right after the meta tag that I already have. Curious if that actually does anything without any styles on it. Nope. But um, if you've ever like looked at one of your projects on your phone and it's teeny, 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 tiny, that meta tag is the uh, is the thing that fixes that. It basically says rather than some arbitrary browser default for width, it should go off of your device's width. Shocker. Um, and so you can pretty safely use that meta tag on literally every project you do. Just FYI. Um, it also, if you've ever like been on something and you can't zoom, uh, and like you're like, ah, why is this happening? Uh, that's also controlled with this. There's another option you can add to this that's like uh, max scale one, uh, where you won't let you zoom it in. Don't do that. It's a terrible idea. It just kills the accessibility on your app. But um, now you know. All right, so we can approach this from two different sides. We have this completely unstyled thing here, and we need to make it look like both of these things, what are the two different ways we can approach that? Design one and the other? Yep. Well, like, I guess that's both of them. But we could start here and smash it down to this, or we could start here and blow it up to this. Why do you think you might do one over the other? easier one way? Like, it's easier to go from small to big versus big to small? Um, why would that be the case? That was just my guess. <laughs> That's a fine guess. What else? Depends on what you expect your user to be doing. Sure. So when we do this to this, we generally call that uh, mobile first development. You've probably heard that term before. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's probably what I do a lot of the time. Uh, it's starting to get a little bit of a black eye, and like, I'm not mad about that either. And the reason why is you'll start with this, because it's really easy to design, uh, and you'll go, okay, well, it gets bigger, and then you start coming up with arbitrary ways to use the space. And the reality is that you need to do this design and this design, and the Jumbotron de, uh, design, and the tablet when it's sideways design, you kind of need to do all of these separately. Uh, you think about the use cases for what you're building, um, and you don't want it to be like, well, and then what, and then what, and then what. Those kind of deserve like separate intentional designs. But part of what we do as developers is figure out what the paths are for how they get from one design to the other. Um, 
And so you could think of this as like mobile implementation first, and I do think that that's probably a little bit easier. Um, but it, it honestly doesn't matter which direction you go. There's no right or wrong on that. Um, awesome. Tell me about the differences you see between these. What are we going to have to do as we wrestle with, as we try to get both of these to happen on the same style sheet? Yes. Um, change the math bar? This has to turn into this. That's not a smaller version of it or a bigger version of it. It's a completely different thing. So what does that hint to us that we're probably going to need to do? Mm, oh, great question. You can do all of this with, uh, without JavaScript. Um, there was once upon a time you had to do all of it with JavaScript because like CSS just didn't have things like media queries and all these other sorts of things. Um, so good guess, but we're going to be able to do this without event listeners. How else? If, I'm, if I have content that's this and it turns into this. Yeah. Probably need a form and then inside of the div. Ooh, interesting. So uh, yeah, maybe have something that is there in at one size and not there in another. And yeah, we can put little hooks that we can grab onto. And really, we're changing content, and so we're adapting it. Media queries are probably going to play some part in that. Media queries are a way in CSS that we can go, all right, when some condition of the device is met, apply this style. And so that could be things like display none or with 100% or whatever. But it does that based on some quality of the viewport. So for example, let's try to make something adaptive. Um, I have this nav bar here. And now I'm also going to put a hamburger. And I want the hamburger to not be there when it's big and to be there when it's small. So I'm going to go into this style sheet. I'll give the span a class of, I don't like calling it hamburger because hamburger is what it looks like. What is it semantically? Menu. I would say even like um, you could identify it as like an icon, so you could say something like menu icon. I don't hate that. Mobile menu would probably also be okay, but like put some thought into what it actually is, not just how it appears. So we say menu icon, and if I do right now, it should be showing up. There's hamburger. So there's hamburger. If I just do display none, it goes away. So how do I toggle this based on size? I mean, know the syntax for media queries? Yeah, there is an at symbol or something. So we do at media, and then the thing after the at media is what the query is. And so what we're going to do is say, um, when the, when it's min width 500 pixels, when it's at least 500 pixels big, could be 501, could be 10,000, when it's at least 500 pixels big, hide, apply this style, which hides it. So now, I should be able to Hamburger is there, and then when it hits, oop, there it is. So when I make the viewport bigger and smaller, it goes away. Questions about how those five lines of code work? That's all we had to do. Cool. 
One other thing, and I want to make sure that everybody's caught up. Um, that word, hamburger, there's few things that irritate me more in a student project than not using glyphs. They're just not hard to include. And so every time I see like the character X when what you really wanted was a cross um, or the word hamburger <laughs> or like uh, three, I've seen people do things where they do like three spans with dashes in them and like line them up. Don't do that shit. So if we want to add glyphs, Font Awesome's, a, there's plenty of them, but Font Awesome's a good one. Font Awesome tries to get you to sign up to use it. You actually don't have to. So if you look up Font Awesome CDN, all we got to do even gives the HTML tag for us. So we can copy that. We'll put it in the head of our HTML like that. Neat. And then what we do inside of this is instead of hamburger, you use an I element. And you give it a class of, I'm going to look it up. It's FA dash something. You go to the Fawn Awesome website. menu, there we go, bars, and it'll tell you what the name of the style is. It's F-A-S and then F-A-Bars. Let's give that a shot. I was that number, like, yes. <laughs> All right, so if I do that, oop, didn't like something. It might just be F-A. There it is. Cool, now we have the glyph. It's really that easy. No excuse to not use glyphs uh, in your apps. Absolutely. That's our media query. There's a special name for this like 500 pixels thing. Everybody know what it is? It's called a breakpoint. Say it all together with me now. Breakpoint, break very good. So uh, you'll likely have different breakpoints in your app, like maybe small phone to big phone to phone on its side to tablet to tablet on its side to laptop to desktop to jumbotron. You can have breakpoints for every single one of those. And you usually want to like know what they are up front, but that's what that is. And you might wonder, cool, is there a standard list of breakpoints? That's probably the wrong way to think of it. What you want to think about is, um, with any given design, how, do, how should it change? Once it gets to this, does that look too big? Does that look too stretched? Cool, that should be a breakpoint. More than like, ah, oh, it's the tablet breakpoint. OK, so what I want you to do now is make sure that you have this working. I do want to see that hamburger icon in there, too. I'm going to give it another two minutes. You'll show to me that you're ready to move on when you can wiggle your viewport and see that hamburger appear and disappear. Like that. Can you write to yourself That gives you every font awesome glyph. And so if you go to the font awesome. So what is a glyph? It just like, could be anything that is. Um... Go to the font awesome website. It'll, it'll probably be easier to understand it that way. And then go to icons. And start scrolling. So any of these. So those, are, those are all glyphs. Just take it as FA. Just FA. Yeah. Because okay. like they, they sell this as a service. So like if you go back to that other page, the ones that are 
uh, bold, those ones are free. The other ones you have to pay for. And those little prefixes are like, is it, uh, is it solid? Is it, has it, does it have a circle around it? And so there's different prefixes for those, but I think from the CDN you just get FA for free. I got a little box. Not what I want. Cool. Let me see your Steam Mouse Pass. Uh, F A. It's beautiful. Hey, good memory, baby. <laughs> it's getting like habit Love it. everywhere. Does it toggle? Yes! Yeah, you gotta uh, import the blossom. Awesome. Let's see if you have it. Yes. the uh, iPad. So after the quote, you want to do an angle bracket to close it. So take a look at mine. Uh, where it's class FA bars quote closing angle bracket. Yeah, very nice. Now save that. that is your uh, serving out of the file system. Um, it's not working? Yeah, it's okay, I don't have that. Um, light server? Yeah. Um, we, had, we had you guys install the node in the first day, didn't we? Or like, this part of your pre-work? Node. Awesome. So go to your terminal and do which um, uh, NPM. Yep. Uh, yeah, which one? Which NPM? Uh, space after which? Yeah. Perfect. So do NPM space I space dash V 
say light, L-I-T, dash, server? Cool. Now, in a terminal window, go to that folder that you made and just type light dash server. Don't fix the problem. Hey, it's a. Uh, go jealousy. Yeah, we're going to do that. No, I didn't know that. I'm using the editor. Do you need it working? Yeah. Uh, I think we'll do that. Do you guys think? And then I think yeah, that's it. But I didn't watch all the refactor, I just watched the very beginning of like okay. I'm close. Like my logic for yeah, like, what I'm doing is like very wacky. It, 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 it might just be because like it's like, uh, it's like white. When you push plus, or something like that. Oh, I'm doing that. Yeah. But so, my logic. All right, back together with me. What questions do we have about the media query? Cool. Yeah. Is media the only one that can write that, or are there other ones that you can use that have template work? Uh, there's import. You can import other styles in, uh, even over networks, which is like how web fonts work. Um, there are they're called directives, and like there's a few of them. I would say that those two are probably the most common. Okay. And then one of the things that SAS does is it gives you a ton more of them. Uh, SAS is st syntactically awesome style sheets. Uh, yes. <laughs> so SAS is a superset of CSS. Superset's a math term. Anybody know what that means? So if this is CSS, this is SAS. It includes everything in CSS plus lots of other cool stuff. So if you just if you have SAS running, and you take a style sheet and change the extension from .css to .scss, uh, it works. And now you can do tons of other stuff like nesting selectors and variables and functions and all kinds of cool stuff. Yep. Yep. Let's take a look at the things that we can query. We actually do like quite a few different things. You can do different style sheets for like printing things. Uh, or if you're using uh, accessibility services, you can hide elements to accessibility services, which can be useful. All right, and so these are Let's see. You can target things that have particular features. So like you can't hover on a mobile device, but you can on something that uses a pointing device or something that um, like a, I can hover on my tablet like this. So you can query to see if a device has something and apply styles based on that. You can you can even do crazy stuff like say, um, I want uh, this to apply to any device with a color screen versus monochrome. And you can even do like logical operators on them. If the viewport is at least 30 M's big and it's in landscape mode, then apply these styles. So that is a ton of power that we get with media queries. And that's how we do adaptive designs. What questions do you have about creating adaptive layouts with media queries? Yeah, Samantha. I imagine with being able to use like the and and trying to be adaptive, your code or your CSS gets very long. Yes. It definitely does. And SAS helps with that. Let me show you an actual style sheet that I use in, uh, in the develop number site. So one of the ways that I, uh, I do this is we have a grid system on that site. And so this is the grid. And it's nine columns wide. 
except at this breakpoint, at which case it collapses to one. That like doing this in regular CSS would be exhausting. Um, it would easily be 30 times as much CSS. Um, but being able to do stuff like nest these things and have these as functions that I or uh, like kind of drop-ins that I can just apply to anywhere that needs them, that's powerful. So basically, you can easily take what we're doing now and apply it with this. Yes. Um, but you get the extra power of setting a variable of small breakpoint. Yes. So each single one of those, you don't have to put the... Exactly. Right. So I get that with SAS. So you have to have this, so you have the size of SAS, you have to put that in the general SAS? Exactly. So if I look over here, Imports in sizes. Yeah, it's cool. Exactly. So, um, yes, yes. Uh, so, like, this is a brutalist site, and so it's white, black, and an accent. Uh, the one that the standard site for Denver. Uh, this actually has like a shit ton of colors in it, believe it or not. It's not immediately obvious, but... Uh, and there's videos of like me making this palette. But all of those um, are available throughout the app. And so like when I'm doing a gray, I can say gray five, and I go, this is too dark, and then I can lighten it up. or. Um, this is too light, and I can darken it up. And so you just go through the numbers. It's pretty sick. Um, awesome. Other questions about doing, um, uh, what are we talking about? Media queries with adaptive layouts. Stacey. Can you um, decide what your breakpoints are? Do you just play with it on different screens? Yep. There's, pl there's like starting points. Like, but even like these 500, just rough it in. As you start adding elements and working with this, you'll go like, this could actually stretch out a little bit more, and then you bump that up. Um, that's like, that's what real designers do. What uh, amateur hour looks like is, uh, what did Bootstrap use? Those three, works for me. <laughs> but yeah, there's, there's really no better like science to this than just kind of playing with it a little bit. Because your design is always gonna be, have different, uh, responsiveness needs than somebody else's design is. And having, this is unrelated, but mm -hmm. having multiple CSS files, is that common in developing SAS? Like you, yeah, you it's like. Can you use that just to organize? Yeah, so you can use that to organize. You can also use imports to sort of alleviate some of that, but that's not actually different files. It's just you put the links to them in different places. You put it in the style sheet instead of in the HTML. But yeah, in the pre uh, SAS world, it was pretty common to have a bunch of style sheets on something. And part of what SAS does is you can put in hundreds of different files and then compile it down to one. And then you're only making one network request, which is pretty cool. That's not a SAS specific thing. That's called concatenation. You can actually do that with regular CSS too, but you need tools. Great question. What else? All right, so um, uh, next, I want to talk about the first objective, <laughs> <laughs> positioning content with Flexbox. So even if you've already read it before, I've read it a lot of times, so so can you. We're going to read the Flexbox article. If you look up Flexbox on the web, a complete guide to Flexbox is going to be the first result. This is literally everything you need to know about Flexbox. There is nothing else. This is all I know about Flexbox. It's good enough for me. It's good enough for you. Um, you might want to read through the background and basics and terminology, but I'm going to give you, let's we'll start with five minutes and uh, give this guy a read through. Go.
Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Another 30 seconds or so. We'll talk about it in a second. Um, that doesn't involve making fake elements. I've done that before. It sucks. I know. It seems like janky, but mm -hmm. obviously There's a fix. So, um, all right. Now what I want you to do is for the next minute, I would like you to brain dump. Just doesn't need to be organized. Everything that you know about Flexbox right now, dump it out on the page. One minute. Go. Write it out. Word vomit.
All right, pencils down. So, let's uh, let's start with. Actually, I take a different angle on this. Question. Yeah. Why is flex over grid? Or like use flex box versus grid. Um, usually use grid for application wide layout. Use flex box for like elements of something. And so I could imagine this entire thing being in a grid, and like that's maybe what's defining where these go. The spacing between these is probably something like flex. You can do most things with uh, with either, honestly. Um, but there was this like dirty rumor going around when grid came out. I was like, ah, oh, now we don't have to do flex anymore. Is horseshit. <laughs> I, I use both of them all the time. Um, but if, the, if you have to have one in your toolbox, it should probably be flex. Good question. All right. So this is what I think is important for you to know about Flexbox right now. The idea that there are flex parents or flex containers and children. And then when you flex a container or a parent, all you're affecting is the direct children of that. Direct children. The children can have children, can have children, can have children. Doesn't have anything to do with those. It's just immediate descendants. That's the first thing you need to know. Second thing that I think is really important to know is the idea of a main axis and a cross axis. Um, the main axis can be horizontal or vertical. It's horizontal by default. The cross axis is whatever the opposite of that is. And part of the cool thing about flex is that we can position things and space stuff out on both axes, but we, can, we have to choose one of them to be the dominant axis. That's the second thing that I think you need to need to need to know. The third thing that you need to know is that we can justify content on the main axis and we can align items on the cross axis. So if my main axis and cross axis are like this and I do justify content space between, it spaces them evenly on here. It doesn't affect their vertical positioning at all though. If I do align items center, it vertically centers them. If I do justify content center, then it tries to jam them all into the middle here. If I do flex start on the unaligned items, it puts it vertically at the top. But then if I flip the axes, opposite. If that's all you know about Flexbox, you'll get pretty far. Um, with flex direction. Or um, I, I tend to use flex flow, and we'll see that in a sec. That also sets whether or not things are allowed to wrap. All right. Flex parents have children. There's a main axis and a cross axis. Justify content. Where on the main axis does it go? Align items. Where on the cross axis does it go? Okay. With that in mind, let's let's start with the um, with the desktop layout for this. Let's focus just on the header for right now. What flex thing am I doing that makes those look like that? Love it. So if I'm looking at the site, all right, so this is what I have right now. The HTML for that is here. All right, so my header has an H1 and a nav and then the span that we can make go away with our immediate query. So I'm guessing I can flex this header and then it's immediate children. I can figure out where on that axis they go. Adam thinks I can space between them. I'm kind of inclined to agree. 
So I say header display flex, and then I justify content space between. Hot rats. That, uh, there we go. So I've got them out to the end. It's not exactly what it looked like in my sketch, though. There's some, like, breathing room around all this stuff. What's that breathing room called in CSS? Padding. padding. Yeah. So let's say that the header also has some padding. I'm going to give it two rims. All right. That's starting to kind of look like something. So this nav list vertical here, hmm, that doesn't sound right. Why not? So if I display flex, watch when nothing happens. Uh-oh. Why didn't that work? And this is worth paying attention to because you're going to make this mistake a thousand times. Uh, Stacy. I have flexed the UL, not the LIs. I want to flex that. So really I need a UL that's in the nav. And now I've got them all next to each other. I could also say that um, nav li's, um, oh, this is kind of a neat trick. This is like uh, where the plus symbol comes in for CSS. Any li that follows an li should have a margin left of like one rem, and it spaces them out. Because um, this is saying any li that's inside of a nav does not need to be a direct child. This is saying a ul that is a direct child. I just want to skip the ul in the selector. That's how you do it. Yeah, Adam. Indeed. Um, even better than that, you can use a, uh, a scale, but that's like a nightmare to do without SAS. So for just messing around, REMs are like a go-to tool. All right, and then there was some kind of background on this header too. So we'll say the background color, um, something kind of purpley. So red, green, blue. So it's going to be in between blue and red. So we go 360 degrees. A little less than that. So what's 330 look like? Half saturation, half lightness. And I want a little bit more blue than that. So if I knock 10 off of that, sweet. And then I'm going to lighten it. Mm. Yeah, I'm going to lighten it up a lot. Nice. Um, like we were talking about this in Denver Dev the other day. That's what's so dope about HSL. It's so much better than figuring out how much more red does this need? How much more green should this have? Um, what's the base color? How saturated is it? How light is it? All right, so uh, I've got this header. And that sort of kind of looks like um, the way that I sketched it out. Now, oh, one other thing we could do. We could say that that um, nav UL maybe has a, also has a background color. Uh, it's white. And maybe that has some padding also. Something like that. Okay, now these two things are um, aren't vertically aligned. So how do I vertically align these? Align items. Very good. So that's going to be over here. Align items center. And now they're vertically aligned. 
<coughs> okay, let's go back to media queries. As I'm doing the adaptiveness on this, uh-oh, the hamburger shows up, but the other one doesn't go away. So what do I do? Yeah. yeah. How about that whole nav? So maybe I say the nav is display none except when we're hiding this, in which case it should be display block. Yeah. That's just for readability. Um, and well, I guess actually this does matter. This is the baseline, and if this is true, then these this overrides this. Because it does read it top to bottom. And now when I do that, cool, that shows up and turns into that. That's pretty dope. Questions? Mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, event listener. So you could say cursor pointer, and then I make this little. Oops, that should have. Oh, hang on, it's the. Um, that is that. Cool, so now it gets a little hand over it and then you attach an event listener to that. Probably does something like toggles a class to display none that, uh, that nav. Could be the, literally the exact same element. It just also has a media query to be vertical now. Good question. So one last thing. These um, LIs inside the section. These are supposed to look like, look like that, and then turn into that. So let's say section LIs. I'm gonna um, yeah, let's see. I'm gonna take a section UL first. I'm gonna flex that also. Let's see what that did. All right, all right. I probably want the same padding that I did on the header. So that had two rems of padding. The, uh, and actually we can even extract that out since it's gonna be shared. It's a header, comma, main. Both of those should have two rems of padding. All right, getting in the ballpark. And then we'll say these LIs have a padding of two rems each. All right, cool. Now, they're not wrapping. Drop a beat. I'm actually gonna give these a box shadow also of one, two, or one pixel, two pixels, and HSL zero, zero percent, eighty percent. Okay. Um, I can do the same plus trick to give them a little bit of space on the side. Okay. Now, next, oh, actually, that's not going to work on the Flexbox, never mind. Take it back. The, uh, and then the next thing I'm going to do is tell this to um, flex flow, that's setting your axis and whether or not things are allowed to wrap, to row wrap. Oh, but I can also justify content 
space between on these. And there we go. That is a responsive web app. Does it look like the diagram? Starts there, turns into that. Starts here, turns into that. Uh, all right, I gotta hop into uh, classes with Hashketeers, but uh, I got time for two more questions. Zero is red. So we go zero and 360. It's the same thing. Are red. And then it's green, blue. Exactly. And 240 is blue. And so you can just use some mental math to figure out a guess of that. And then you can just rotate the green in the other direction. Oh, so the reason you it doesn't matter. Exactly. The first two don't matter. If it's totally desaturated, it doesn't matter what color it is. Other questions? Going once, going twice. Sold! Thank you very much. Thank you.